Hey, good morning, friends. Welcome to River Heights Vineyard Church. Welcome to worship today. Hey, Sandy. My name is John. I'm one of the worship pastors here. <clears throat> I'm here with Rob and Justine. Again, we are really happy to welcome you to our service today. I invite you to stand with us as we come into our time of worship. If it works better to rise in spirit, please do that. But let's rise up together as we come into the presence of God. <clears throat> I'll pray for us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as we do every week, we are here in anticipation of what you're going to do, what you are already doing in our lives, as you are bringing us here together in the name of Jesus, to try to respond to the love that you have given us, to get more of that. Would you give us more of that love today, Holy Spirit? Come and move in powerful ways. Help us say yes to you, to the good things that you're doing. Amen. Silver and gold, what your faith has taught me to cherish. In this light, affliction is not my home. In winter, I believe you. In springtime, I see you. It's so good to be with you. My hope. Lord, you made all things new. Your love is my breakthrough. Now I sing hallelujah. My hope has come. No, oh, I'm not going to give in to this mortal frustration. And I'm not going to give death any standing ovation. Soul, God, with no hesitation, is between you and me. There is no separation. No separation. separation in winter I believe you in springtime I see you it's so good to be with you my hope has come Lord you make all things new your love is my breakthrough now I sing hallelujah, my hope has come in winter. In winter, I believe you, in springtime I see you. It's so good to be with you, my hope has 
has come. Lord, you make all things new. Your love is my breakthrough. Now I sing hallelujah. My hope has come.
Praise you, God. Friends, you're welcome indeed to have a seat at this time. It's wonderful to worship together. Hopeful is going to bring some announcements now. I am indeed. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Glad to see you today. My name is Hopeful, and I'm here to be your praise leader and your pastor this morning. I get to be right here in the back of the church, and it's just been so much fun to be able to share this morning. Um, a couple of things to break down as we start into worship. Any of you that are on here with us for the call to worship, spend time here in our church uh, with feeling gratitude towards the people who have loved us into being. And if those people for you include a father, a mentor, a father figure, someone who played that role in your life, we just encourage you to spend some time in gratitude for those people today. And those of you who are caring for children, whether those are grown children, children whom you have lost, um, whoever, whatever your relationship is, if you feel like a father right now, um, we bless you today in a special way. We are really glad you're here. Um, I uh, Interestingly, I was thinking of wearing some Father's Day commemorative footwear today, but I couldn't decide between white sneakers or socks and sandals. Um, actually, I'm curious. Who thinks white sneakers are more of a dad footwear? Okay, what about socks and sandals? Ah, socks and sandals. Okay, I'll remember that for next year. <laughs> So if you are here for the first time in particular, we are so glad you are here. In fact, we have a welcome gift to just say that we're happy to see you. You're welcome to meet up after the service at the Welcome Center just through those doors. Uh, John Marsden, who is giving the message today in just a few minutes, has a welcome gift for you. It does include chocolate. Our purpose at River Heights is to help a growing number of people loving God, loving others, and in doing so, changing the world. One way that we support that as people who are a part of River Heights is by giving financially towards this purpose. Whatever you are called to do in the world, whether it is supporting people in recovery, whether it is caring for children, whether it is seeing new people hear about Jesus, River Heights is probably involved in some sliver of that in some way. So when you give to River Heights, you get to put your hand in alongside God in doing the work that you and the rest of our body is called to do in the world. Um, you can give by check or cash by dropping those items in the wooden boxes in the back of the room or on the way out. And you can also give electronically using PushPay, the uh, QR code on the screen. If you can figure out how to use that, props to you, um, will also take you to a donation portal. Let me just pray for that giving real fast. God, thank you for being generous to us, giving us what we need and surrounding us with people who give us what we need. Would you empower our church to also give others what they need to be a place where our needs and others' needs are met? We want to see you meeting those needs. Use the money that we give this week to bless our community in your name. Amen. All right. If you got a paper program, looks something like this today. That program has a heavier cardstock striped item in the middle of it. This is called our connection card. Every week that you are with us, we invite and encourage you to share as much or as little as you are comfortable sharing on the connection card, even if all you do is write your first name or initials. The reason for this is that every week our prayer team prays by name for every person who we know of who came to the church service. If you would like to see good things happen in your life, being prayed for is a pretty good place to start. Um, if you would like to be more specific with the prayer needs that you have in your own life or others' lives, on the back of that connection card is a place where you can write ways that you need to see God move in your life and in other people's lives. Uh, once again, share as much or as little to guide us as we pray for you. 
And if you have recently seen God working in your life or the life of someone around you, please share briefly, um, if you would like to, on the bottom of your connection card. Uh, tell us what God has been up to. And if you check the box that says you're comfortable sharing this with the public, you may see it in um, before service next week um, in the pre-service slideshow. All right. If you have been out into the lobby today, which I'm guessing everyone has, you might have noticed some flyers on the wall. Those flyers are for our summer life groups, which officially kick off today. Life groups are chances to connect with other people in our church. They are chances to support each other. Some groups are focused on reading a book together, reading the Bible together. Some are focused on things like um, physical fitness goals. Uh, that is led by Becca Bunger. If anyone has met Becca, you probably experience her like I do as someone who could encourage you to do anything. I feel like if Becca told me to, I don't know, sprout gills and start swimming underwater, I would, I would be able to do it. Um, so <laughs> there's also groups that are grouped by gender or by age group. If you find a group that works for you, um, show up, check it out, and you, it is not too late to sign up. Um, Sun Sunday, June 30th, we will be having only one service that day. Uh, that will be the 1030 service. So that is the service you are currently at. Um, that is because there is a barbecue celebration following this service. River Heights is providing the barbecue meat, the substance of the meal, but we encourage everybody to bring a side or a dessert to share. Even if all you have is a bag of Tostitos chips, they will get eaten probably by me. Um, and let us know on your connection card, remember this one, um, if you are planning on attending and how many people from your family will be joining, just so we have enough meat. All right. How many people in this room have ever experienced an emotion? Okay, then this announcement is relevant for you. Um, we have an opportunity coming up August 23rd to 24th, which will come here before we know it, to attend a great workshop in our own Twin Cities area. We will now check out a quick informational video on this opportunity on the screen behind me. I'm Justin. I'm the lead pastor at South Metro Vineyard, if we haven't had a chance to meet. I just wanted to send a personal invitation to you to something great that's coming in August. It is the Emotionally Focused Formations Weekend. It is a Friday and Saturday, a full day, and it's on August 23rd and 24th. So we're trying to give you enough lead time so you could plan accordingly to be there for the full Friday and Saturday. In Emotionally Focused Foundations, we spend some time thinking about how did I become the person that I am? And how do I respond when things are difficult or awkward or I have anxiety? And on top of that, how is Jesus inviting me into transformation in this next season of my life? I've done lots and lots of trainings, and I have found that this program has so many of the great things that I've done and seen in other places all put together in the same package, and it is very Jesus-focused in a way that I love. So we would love to have you come and join us. Registration is open right now, and you could sign up. Spaces are already uh, starting to fill up. So just want you to know that you are invited and that I couldn't recommend this really any higher. I would think that you have some people in your church body who have also done this. So uh, ask around a little bit and see who's taken emotionally focused in your church body. I'm sure they would be happy to answer some questions to you. So hope to see you there. Thanks. Getting to hang out with Justin Law is one of the many perks of participating in Emotionally Focused. I saw Jerry and Joe and Ronnie just go <gasps> when he came up on the screen. There's a lot of Justin fans here. Um, if you have questions about Emotionally Focused, you can check out the insert in your program that has all the information about it with a QR code to register. Uh, if you have more questions after pursuing that first option, you are welcome to talk to our local celebrity, Sandy Knutson, who's sitting up here at the front of the church. Um, in the meantime, if you are in middle school, please uh, feel free to process to middle church, which is happening in the usual location, and enjoy. Bless you. In the meantime, John Marsden is going to come up to deliver our message in just a few minutes, but we encourage you to spend a moment to say hello to someone close by.
Well, good morning, everybody. Great to see all of you here and all the local celebrities among us. That's awesome. Uh, really appreciate you coming. Uh, my name is John. Sue and I, we have the privilege of helping get this community started some 34 years ago along with the team. And we are glad that we're still here. And we're glad that you're here. It's uh, going to be a wonderful day. Thank you so much for coming. If you are new, uh, boy, I'd love to meet you. I will be out there. But thank you for coming, and those of you that are joining online, thank you as well. Uh, I'm excited to share a message with you in our series on Exodus. Uh, we're calling it Freedom and Rest, and we're looking at the whole story through the lens of like Moses' life. And uh, the Exodus story is the, the primary or dominant story of the entire Old Testament, and is a really great lens to understand the whole Bible. It is a really good picture going forward of what Jesus is going to do when he leads us out of our own particular kind of bondages or slavery to things that gripped our lives. So I'm excited to talk about that with you today. Peter and Rena have done a great job these first two weeks sharing how God protected Moses' life and then called him to lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. And as Rena said so well last week, God overcame Moses' many many, many objections. Uh, so I have a question for you as we get started. I'm going to ask you a variety of questions today. The first one is, have you ever struggled to do what God wants you to do? Anybody like me out here in the crowd? Uh, have you ever experienced resistance or opposition, either from outside of you, family, friends, uh, or from internally? Uh, my mother, when uh, my sister and I came to Jesus and wanted to convert our little rural Minnesota town of 365 people in one weekend, we were super zealous and super unwise, uh, she really got embarrassed. Uh, she did not have, she, she I, mean, I can still remember, some of you heard the story, I was sleeping on the couch, we didn't have a ton of bedrooms back from college, and I heard her and my dad having this really energetic conversation in the kitchen. And my mom was saying things like this, we must send them to a deprogrammer. <laughs> I don't know if you ever remember deprogrammers that came out of like the Korean War, uh, people that have had their brain washed, they needed to have it rewashed, whatever. And uh, I'm thinking, where are my car keys? I am getting back, to going back to school. Because I came to Jesus because I was a really broken person. And I didn't want to go to somebody else who would totally confirm all that and show me any gr more brokenness, okay? So my dad says these amazing words. I thank God for this all the time. He said, oh, Beth, they're just zealous. They've, this is my older sister and I. They've always been zealous. If this is another of their fads, it will be over in three weeks. And if it's not, well, we all know that they really need God in their lives. And so let's just wait. He was really wise, and uh, thankfully... Um, he came to Jesus when he was 55. My mom, when she was 85, and she was part of this church and this community, meant so much to my mom coming to faith and growing up. And I'll be forever grateful to all of you who had a hand in that. So, have you ever struggled to do what God wants you to do? Uh, I certainly have. I've gotten in my own way. I have been my own worst enemy at many times. Uh, when God called Sue and I to move to Inver Grove Heights to, to start this work along with a wonderful team, I had many objections. I, didn't, I had many sleepless nights, and I would say things like, I've never planted a church. Sue's never planted a church. My kids have never planted a church. Our team's never planted a church. Our church has never planted a church. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And in Jesus, not audibly, but as clear as audibly in my mind, that's the way Jesus speaks to me in my thoughts, he said, Oh, John, give it a rest. Uh, he said, I have planted churches all over the world. There are all kinds of people. What I'm looking for you is willingness to learn and follow me. We can do this. And so I kept saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. He kept saying, I can and I will. I can and I will. I can and I will. Looks like he won because we're all here. I'm so glad Jesus. You know, Jesus has won the big victory on the cross and resurrection. But he wins victories every single day through your life and mine as we simply trust and follow him. So he's going to win through your life today. If 
okay, as you trust him. All right, um, so second question, how has God helped you overcome resistance? If you've had resistance to do God's will, either externally or internally, how has he helped you overcome that? We want to look at that today. So we're going to look at the first of many conversations Moses and Aaron had with Pharaoh. I think we can learn a lot from Moses' life experience as he learned to persevere to lead Israel out of Egypt into the land God promised. So we pick up the story in Exodus 4, 29 to 31. I'm going to read these three little verses, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more with you because I felt God uh, kind of land and linger on these verses when I was reading them this week. Then Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt and called all the elders of Israel together. Aaron told them everything the Lord had told Moses. Remember, God said, okay, Aaron will be your mouthpiece. I'll tell you, you tell Aaron, Aaron, Aaron will tell the people. So Aaron did that. And Moses performed the miraculous signs as they watched. And then the people were convinced that the Lord had sent out Moses and Aaron. So can I ask you, what convinced the people that God had sent Moses and Aaron? I'm going to suggest it's two things. One, it was God's good and truthful words that Aaron shared about God's plan, what he was planning to do. And two, it was God's good and powerful works that Moses performed. So he got truth and power right here in these three verses. And that convinced the Israelites that God was, had really sent them. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them, remember how God said to Moses at the burning bush, I have seen the oppression my people are experiencing. I've heard their cries. I want to just stop there a second. That was, that's not only true of the Israelites. That's how God looks at his people. That's how God looks at people everywhere. He sees you. He hears your cries, whatever they may be. And I know life is a series of ups and downs and twists and turns and all kinds of things. So some of you, you may be at the top. You might be having just a great time. We are really happy for you. And some of you might be at a, like a low point. And we're, we're sad about that and we want to be helpful. But God sees it all. Some of you are in the middle or you bounce between the highs and the lows like I do. Uh, God sees you and he hears your cries. And he's come to save you even today, just like he did the Israelites. We're going to pray about that in a few minutes when I, when I wrap up. Well, truth, truth, and, truth and disclosure, it'll be more than just a few minutes. Okay, but we are going to pray for you when I, when I bring this to a close. Uh, when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. Doesn't that draw you to worship when you realize God really loves me? He really loves me. He's with me. He understands me when nobody else does. He sees what I'm going through. Doesn't that just pull your heart toward him? That's why I came to Jesus. Because somebody told me, Jesus loves you, and he's, he's got good things for you, John. To which I responded with all the faith in the world. Really? <laughs> me? Because I felt like God had this low-grade frustration with me. Sometimes it would burp up to, like, actual anger with me. Because I was not, like, a really... I mean, I wasn't a bad person, but I did a lot of things that weren't, like, very helpful to those around me. And uh, I just felt like God was kind of, like, keeping away from me until good friends, like my sister and her friends, said, no, Jesus loves you. He's changing our lives. He can change yours if you'll give him a chance. I'm so glad I did. It's been 55 years, and he's been so good to me. So I think we need God's good and truthful words and God's good and powerful works to experience the life God has for us, to, to fulfill the purpose he has, to, to sustain, to keep going in a good direction. I believe God knows that, and th so that's a central theme in the whole Bible. For example, Jesus, the Bible says in, in Matthew 4, he went around teaching and preaching the kingdom. That's good and truthful words. And healing every kind of sickness and disease, casting out demons, cleansing lepers, stopping storms, feeding multitudes, it was good and powerful works, both ends. Jesus was a word worker. Paul, and then Jesus said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And what's the Holy Spirit going to do? He's going to lead you into all the truth. That's John 15. And Acts 1 says, and when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive what? Power. So the Holy Spirit comes to bring truth and power into our lives 
to transform us and help us be useful to do like what Hopewell mentioned, the healing for the world, caring for those, doing, being able to be part of something much bigger than we could have ever imagined. Okay? So Paul followed Jesus' example. Romans 15, 18, 19 says this. Yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message, words, by the way I worked among them. They were convinced, interestingly, just like the Israelites, by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. In this way, I fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. So Paul did his ministry with, with truth and power. Now, I... I chose my phrases intentionally, good and truthful words, good and powerful works. Because I know power can be used badly. And I know people can like trick people with their words and use them badly and oppress people with their words and judge them. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about God's good and truthful words that will set you free and his good and powerful works who will energize you and help you to move forward. All right, <clears throat> let's look at uh, Moses and Aaron as they go to have their first conversation with Pharaoh. And the basic phrase is, let my people go. Can you say that with me? Let my people go. Can you say it with just a little more gusto? Let my people go. Okay. That's, you know what? That's God's phrase for all of us in all of our life. Wherever we might be, whatever we might get into, wherever we might get stuck, he wants to help you. Okay. So after the presentation to Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. And they told him, well, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Is that so? retorted Pharaoh. And who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him? And let Israel go. I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Now, I picture Pharaoh sneering, mocking as he's saying these words. Because Pharaoh was considered a god in Egypt, small g. And he, could, he thought the god of Israel was like, again, like a territorial god. Like the Egyptians had gods, the other nations do. He was just another territorial god. Plus his people were enslaved, for heaven's sakes. So who, who had the power? The Egyptian god or the god of Israel? Well, it was the Egyptian god. So he gave no credence to any of this and wanted no part of it. But Aaron and Moses persisted. The God of the Hebrews has met with us, they declared. So let's, let us take a three-day journey, kind of like a three-day weekend, into the wilderness so we could offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. If we don't, he will kill us with the plague or with the sword. I don't remember God actually saying that to Moses and by the burning bush, but I don't know. I, I'm, I'm guessing Moses and Aaron were scrambling a little bit here, and that was probably the way Pharaoh thought about gods. If you don't do what they say, they'll kill you. So anyway, that's just my guess. It's kind of a weird thing to say. Uh, Pharaoh replied, Moses and Aaron, why are you distracting the people from their tasks? Get back to work. Look, there are many of your people in the land, and you're stopping them from their work. Pharaoh thought they just wanted a vacation. Okay? And he said, no, this is my workforce, and I'm going to keep that. So he says a loud no. He doesn't know the Lord. He won't listen to the Lord, and he refuses to do what the Lord says. In his pride and arrogance, he begins to harden his heart as God confronts them. So you'll see this happening, that Pharaoh's heart is hard right from the beginning. But it gets harder and harder and harder and harder and harder as, long as, as God confronts him. And then Romans 9, eventually then the Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart to get this done, and he raised him up for a purpose. It's an interesting dialogue there, but I think what happened is Pharaoh was hardening, 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 and God said, okay, that's what you want to be? Then be that. Pharaoh is the epitome of an autocratic and a totalitarian leader. And I am sure glad we have none of those today. Aren't you that we live in a world with butterflies, balloons, everybody's kind to each other, everybody wants the best. You know, yeah, that's not the world we live in, is it? We've had autocratic, totalitarian leaders all through the history of the world. We have a bunch of them right now. Vladimir Putin would be a classic example of this. So 
move on. That same day, Pharaoh sent this order to the Egyptian slave drivers and the Israelite foremen. Don't supply any more straw for making bricks. Make the people get it themselves. But still require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They're lazy. That's why they're crying out, let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Load them down with more work. Make them sweat. That will teach them to listen to lies. Now, straw was a binding agent in the brick-making process. It held the materials together while the bricks were forming. So they needed straw. All right. Um, so the slave drivers and foremen went out and told the people, well, this is what Pharaoh says. I will not provide any more straw for you. Go get it yourselves. Find it wherever you can. But you must produce just as many bricks as before. So the people scattered throughout the land of Egypt in search of stubble to use as straw. Meanwhile, the Egyptian slave drivers continued to push hard, meet your daily quota of bricks, just as you did when we gave you the, provided you the straw. And then they whipped the Israelite foreman they had put in charge of the workers. Why haven't you met your quotas, either yesterday or today, they demanded. And so the Israelite foreman went to Pharaoh, and they pleaded with him, please don't treat your servants like this, they begged. We're given no straw, but the slave drivers still demand, make bricks. We're being beaten, but it's not our fault. It's your own people are to blame. Pharaoh shouted, you're just lazy, lazy. He probably said lazy a few more times. <laughs> That's why you're saying, let us go and offer sacrifices to the Lord. Now get back to work. No straw will be given to you. You must still produce the full quota of bricks. So the Israelite foreman could see that they were in serious trouble when they were told, you must not reduce the number of bricks you make each day. So as they left Pharaoh's court, they confronted Moses and Aaron who were waiting outside for them. I'm sure wondering, well, what happened in your conversation with Pharaoh? Ah, so they unload on Moses and Aaron. May the Lord judge and punish you for making us stink before Pharaoh and his officials. You've put a sword in their hands, an excuse to kill us. So then Moses went back to the Lord, and he did what he is really, really good at. He's protesting and objecting. <laughs> Moses was a really skilled complainer and protester, I think, right? Do we have any other really skilled complainers, protesters in the crowd today? Nobody's raising, well, a few people are raising their hands. Yeah, I think I could win, I think I could win a blue ribbon if there was a contest at the state fair for that. Anyway, God's been working on that with me for 55 years. Okay. Uh, so, why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he's been even more brutal to your people, and you have done nothing to rescue him. You ever have conversations somewhat like that with God when you're hoping for something, looking for something, wanting something, and it's just not happening? Uh, how many of you know that you might have a, a timetable for life decisions and changes? And God has a timetable, and they don't always, they don't always match. I remember when we were leaving a church in Eden Prairie that we were part of, and I was moving to Burnsville to run a bookstore, and our pastors and small group leaders prayed for us to bless us as we left. And the pastor did this prop prophetic word over, over me. It related to both Sue and I, but in that period of time, women in that group could not be pastors, so he spoke to me. Uh, sad, but that's the way it worked. Uh, and he said, uh, you know, God has called you to pastor a church. And when the time is right, everyone will see it, and it will be good for you and your family. And then he felt kind of bad. He said, I'm sorry. You're leaving, and we just unloaded that on you. I'm sorry. And I said, no, don't be sorry. I, I feel like God has been saying something like that. It's a nice confirmation. So anyway, I tell Sue, and I'm really excited. Like, maybe, 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 I, maybe I have a future. Maybe I can actually do something significant in my life, you know. Have you all have dreams, have, hoping to make a, a real difference in the world? So a couple weeks later, that pastor leaves to go back to Michigan, and they need a pastor at that church. And I put two and two together and get about 26, uh, and I come home and tell Sue, I said, hey, the church in Eden Prairie needs a pastor. Uh, they prophesied over us that uh, we're called to do that. You think I should apply? <laughs> and Sue, bless her heart, is so kind, she said, well, uh, you could, uh, but that's kind of a big church. It was about 600 people, and we've never, like, pastored anything but, like, a 20-person small group. So do you think maybe God would have us start with something a little smaller? And, you know, do you ever have a balloon pop 
and spin around and land behind your refrigerator? Well, that's what I felt like. Oh, and I thought, I'm such an arrogant fool. Uh, and I told Sue that. She said, you are not. You have dreams. It's a good thing. But you know, there's something called timing in life. And there are certain times where it wouldn't be helpful, and certain times it really would. I don't think this is the time. And I said, okay. And I will never talk about my dreams again, you know. <laughs> in my head, I said that. I didn't say that out loud to her. Uh, and then it was like, join the staff of the church in Burnsville. And so it was 10 years from when that prophetic word was spoken until Lake River Heights started. And so uh, timing is a big deal. And learning to trust God in the midst of when things are not seemingly moving forward the way you hope, that's a huge thing. That's part of where faith is formed. That's part of where character is formed in our lives. And you may be in some situation like that now where it's kind of a little in-between time. Yeah. But in-between times are good times. God moves in those times. Now, so Moses complains, and here we see the classing, uh, clashing excuse me, of two kingdoms. The kingdom of God is moving forward through Moses and Aaron to set God's people free. And the kingdom of darkness is resisting that movement through Pharaoh's hard-heartedness. You know, Pharaoh is like the worst person we meet in the Bible up to this point. We meet some other pretty bad people later as well. You probably read that. You will find that if you keep reading in the Bible. You meet really great people that trust God and really terrible people. It's a, the Bible's a really honest book. Uh, he was considered, as I said, a god. He's probably one of the clearest examples of Satan in the Bible. And so we will see the battle of two kingdoms playing out over and over as God strikes Egypt with powerful acts of judgment against its false gods. Uh, come and hear more about this next week. John Hodge is, is going to be sharing. So they feel opposition from Pharaoh, and they feel criticism from their people. How does God respond to Moses' complaints? <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, Now you'll see what I will do to Pharaoh. And when he feels the force of my strong hand, he will let the people go. In fact, he will force them to leave his land. God had said that to Moses way back in Exodus 3 at the burning bush. But I suspect Moses forgot it. And so now God's reminding him. He's going to feel the force of my strong hand, and he will let the people go. And then he said to Moses, I'm Yahweh, the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty, but I didn't reveal my name Yahweh to them. Let me just stop here a second. One of the early vineyard scholars is a guy named Bill Jackson. He wrote a wonderful book called The Radical Middle, which is kind of the early history of the vineyard movement. If you're interested, it's a really good book to read. Uh, uh, Bill says this. The name Yahweh means something like the God who will be dynamically, effectively present when he is needed and when people call on him. The Israelites were now about to find out what does that name mean. I reaffirmed my covenant with them. Under its terms, I promised to give them the land of Canaan where they were living as foreigners. You can be sure that I have heard the groans of the people of Israel who are now slaves to the Egyptians, and I'm well aware of my covenant with them. I wanted to say something. God has really heard your groans. You may be in a groaning season right now. You may not, but let me just tell you, there'll probably be groans coming. <laughs> uh, he hears our groans. In fact, you read Romans 8. The Holy Spirit actually takes our groans and he shapes them into prayers that are exactly on target with God. So don't ever dismiss or disrespect your groans. You know, there are times I have not been able to put words to my prayers. Have you, have you ever had that happen? Yeah. Well, groan. Just groan. Now, some there's probably some reference to, like, speaking in a language that you haven't learned I will call it speaking tongues. That's true. But I think there's, there's simply just flat-out groaning. And God hears them because he loves his people. And so he's reaffirming his commitment to them. And then he says, verses 6 to 8, another three jam-packed verses. He says, therefore, Moses, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you. As I read this and as you read it and hear me, just, just notice how many times will is used. I will free you from your oppression 
and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. All right, I want to talk about this a little bit. So interestingly, you'll see a phrase, I am the Lord, in verse 6, and the, in the beginning, and the end is the same phrase, I am the Lord. Uh, that's a literary device. It's called an inclusio, or bracketing, and it's, and it's emphasizing that statement, I'm the Lord. And then the in between the brackets verses explain, what does that mean? What does this Lord do? What kind of Lord is this? So let's look at it. I think God's saying with I am the Lord is, there is no other God like me, there is no ruler, there is no pharaoh that can stand against me and stop me from rescuing my people. Can I say to you, there is nothing that you have ever experienced or ever will experience that can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ. We sang that in, in the Cherry Blossom song. That's out, straight out of Romans 8, I think, 31, 32. Nothing in the present, nothing in the future. No angels, no demons. No suffering you'll ever go through can ever separate you from the love of God because he loves you and he wants to be close to you. All right. He says, I'll free you from your oppression and rescue you from your slavery. What do you need to be set free from now? What kind of habit would you like to break? Some place you go to get your love and joy and support other than God that you'd like to not do? Where do you need freedom in your life? Um, God wants to set you free. Over my 55 years of following Jesus, God has set me free from a spirit of fear. Uh, there was a decisive breaking of that when I turned 50. Now, that, that, I don't mean to discourage you. You don't have to wait till 50 yourself. You can be set free today from that. But for me, it took me a long time. Now, I still get anxiety at times, social anxiety, when I'm in rooms that I don't know anybody. But it doesn't control me. It doesn't stop me from being me. It doesn't stop me from loving other people. You can be set free. If fear has ever been a, a reality that stopped you or held you back, you can, you can leave it today. And I'm going to be praying in a few minutes about that. Fear, anger was a big issue in my life. And you know, he's still working on that, but substantially that's changed, and I'm so grateful. He's also set me free from feelings of shame. I grew up in a shame kind of based family system, and it's taken a while to understand that and to get free of that, but you don't have to live in shame. I felt inadequate most of my life that I could never quite get there. You ever, you ever feel like you're, you're close, but you never quite get there? I felt that so much. Jesus has set me free from those things. He can set you free from anything if you turn to him and trust him. He says, I'll redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. Where do you need God's power in your life right now? Do you need it for endurance? Paul prays for the Colossians, great power for great endurance, to be able to keep on keeping on. We need power to endure. Maybe it's for healing. Maybe you've got some like critical healing needs right now, or maybe you have long-term healing needs that are even hard to ask prayer for. Sue has not been able to hear out of her left ear for 32 years, and we've prayed all kinds of times for that in various meetings where there's great power for healing and all kinds of people were healed. And, you know, I asked Sue, anything happening in your left ear? She said, it's still on my head. <laughs> I said, that's not, that's not what I mean. She said, I know. No, I haven't felt a thing in my ear. But God bless her. She said, but I'm so glad that everybody else is experiencing something. We need power to endure. We need power for healing. We need power for freedom. I'm going to pray for power in a few minutes. I will claim you as my own people. I will be your God. Do you know that God loves you and really wants you in his family? I did not know that growing up. As I mentioned, I felt God had this low-grade frustration with me my whole life. I didn't know there was a family I could be part of. I didn't know if he wanted me in it. But friends told me, John 1, 12, 
Jesus came to his own people. In the main, they rejected him. But those who received him, he gave them the power to become children of God. I read that. They, told, they explained that to me. They said, you can be a child of God like right now. I said, ah, uh, how can that happen? He said, you can just tell Jesus you want to be. And so they led me in a prayer, and I gave my life to Jesus. And I didn't know what was going to happen, if anything. But I felt a sense of peace right away. That was the first thing. And then he began to slowly, by sometimes some things pretty fast, a lot of things slowly change. You know, if you are not sure that you're in the family, that God loves you and that God wants you, you can be sure today. You don't have to leave here without knowing that. So you can give your life to Jesus like right now. Yeah, you can give your life back to Jesus if you're on the way back to Jesus. And so I'm going to say a little prayer here. You can pray in your heart. I'm going to use three simple words that we use all the time. Sorry, please, thank you. All right, if you would say, well, I'd like to give my life to Jesus. I'm not quite sure how to do that. You can just pray with me, and then I'd be glad to talk to you more afterwards, okay? Let me just, let's just pray here. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry that I have not trusted you with my life. I'm sorry for all the things I've done wrong, the things I've said, thought, and done that are wrong, that have hurt others. Please forgive me for those things. Thank you for dying for me so I can be forgiven. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to me so that I can have real power to change and grow and be a new person. I give you my life right now. Please take charge of me and lead me forward. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, God heard you, and he's begun to work in you. And he wants to strengthen and help you. And so we're going to have people up for prayer. I'd love to have you just say, hey, like, I prayed that little prayer with that guy up there, that old guy, and uh, I don't really know what it, what, what it meant, but I prayed it. That's what I, I didn't know what it meant, but I found out. You can find out. You can grow. You can learn. People will help you. That's what we're about here. All right. He said, then you'll know that I'm the Lord who's freed you from your oppression. You, you and I can know God better and better and better as you experience him in your actual life, rescuing you, helping you, giving you wisdom, giving you power to grow and change. So Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord had said, but they refused to listen anymore. They'd become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. You know, is it hard for you to hear God's encouraging words of hope when you're afraid and discouraged? Is that like more difficult? To me, it's like a little Star Trek force field. The words are coming, but they just can't seem to get through. And so I need to like deal with fear and discouragement and have prayer. And so we're going to pray uh, that that would break. But can I just say to you, God never wants you to be afraid. He never wants you to be discouraged. He's the God of all encouragement, not the God of all discouragement. He wants you to be prudent and wise and realize certain pathways are not so good. But you don't have to be afraid to make a wise decision. You just make a wise decision. Okay? The Lord said to Moses, go back to Pharaoh, the king, and tell him to let the people of Israel leave his country. But Lord, Moses objected. He's so good at that. My own people won't listen to me anymore. How can I expect Pharaoh to listen? I'm a clumsy, such a clumsy speaker. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. He gave them orders for the Israelites and for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. So Moses, God bless him, he obeyed God's commands in spite of his fears and objections. And God led and sustained Moses by good and truthful words and good and powerful acts. And he will lead you that way. He's with you. He will lead you forward in your life with truth and power into all that he has for you. He'll give you the power to serve him and fulfill his purpose for your life. He'll give you the power to endure suffering, the power to be healed, the power to live a free and a peaceful life. You and I can be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Could the music team come back up here and, we're going, and, the, and people on the prayer team be like ready? Uh, what we're going to do this morning, I'm going to give you the, some, some tips to like put this into action. You could read Exodus 5 and 6 like I read to you. You could pray, and I would ask you to pray that the Holy Spirit would fill you and our whole community, including all the kids downstairs, including Lavinia. I think they're meeting in a, a park today, which is fun. Uh, but pray, 
for his power to fill us so we can do good works and say good words. And then this week, would you be willing to look for opportunities to share some words of encouragement with others and do maybe some works of power, like pray for somebody that's sick? All right. Uh, as they get ready to lead us, if you would like to receive more of God's power in your life today, I'm going to ask you to stand up just right where you are. If you would like more power, and there's all kinds of reasons that we may feel a need for more of God's power. I've said some of them already. Maybe you need power to persevere. You're going through a difficult time. Maybe you need power to be healed. I have a few healing words I'm going to share, but, maybe, but, but wherever you might need healing, mentally, emotionally, physically, let's see if God would move in power and do something today. Maybe you need power to be free from a bad habit or power to serve. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to, uh, there's a few things I feel like I want to pray over all of us. One is to be free from fear and to see the power of anger broken. Now that you have your own choices. Uh, I'm not going to, I can't make your choices. You can't make mine. I can make mine. You can make yours. But, I, but we can pray for this power. It's almost like, for me, it was like a switch that would just be turned on and I couldn't stop it. Uh, so I'm going to pray that that's broken. And some of you need strength for patience, patient endurance. You're in a waiting situation. You want God to move, but you haven't experienced much of it in the area you need it. So I'm going to pray for strength for you. Some of you have not felt like you've been seen or heard by God. We're going to pray for that. And then here's some physical words. Somebody's got rib pain, and you feel it. You don't know if you've broken a rib or cracked one, but you, it hurts when you take deep breaths. Some of you have difficulty walking, simply weakness in your legs. Some of you have some hip and knee issues that make it hard to walk. Some of you have got migraine-like headache pain. It could be actual migraines, but it could be migraine-like, and it just comes out of the blue. It's, it surprises you, and you thought, oh, no, here it is again. Uh, some, someone's got elbow pain. Someone has got mouth pain and irritation. I realize that's kind of an embarrassing thing to ask for prayer for. Pray for my mouth, you know. But, hey, we all got stuff, right? And so I'm going to pray for God's power to rest on you. I'd encourage you, if you could, just open your hands and see what God might do. And then um, we'll, we'll wait a minute or two. And then I'm going to ask those of you that are around, those that are standing, if you just simply say, could I pray for you? All right? And some of you who are standing may need to ask that question because we got a lot of people standing today, which is awesome. So Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. Or we have sensed this whole service, you're with us. And you're with us to do good. To say good words to us, to encourage us, and to do powerful things in our lives. To change us. And so we welcome you. And I say, Lord, Holy Spirit, come with your power. With good words. And Jesus, we thank you that you do not want any of us controlled by fear or anger. <laughs> Thank you for your promise to, that Paul says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and good judgment. So in the name of Jesus, I break the power of fear. I say, no, you will not control these people. I command you, spirit of fear, just to lift and leave and we break the power of anger, resentment-type anger, raging anger, whatever kind. We break its power. And we say, Lord, would you give us power to be patient and kind and gentle people? Would you give us confidence that you're with us all the time, that you have the wisdom we need? And when we're going in a good path, you'll give us the strength to keep going. And when we might be sliding to the side, you'll just alert us. You'll just say, hey, could I help you get back on course here? So we thank you. We thank you that you see us. We thank you that you care for us. Lord, those of us that are in an in-between season and we really need power, that could be in between in jobs. It could be in between in a relationship or a location. It could be lots of things. But Lord, we ask for your power to keep moving forward toward you.
Now, if, if you need healing somewhere, would you just like raise your hand so those around you could, could see that? And I, I just encourage you to receive the prayer that you need. Okay, there's some people here. So would you just look around, and, the, and if you're near somebody that wants, that needs healing, or you know they do, just ask, could I put my hand on your shoulder? Okay, thank you. And we're going to be singing here, so there's people around that uh, other side over there, if you people could notice. And uh, all you need to do is simply just ask them, how could I pray for you? And then you could simply say it. I'm going to say these words, but you can say them. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And if it's a particular area, you could say, let, let that area. If it's an elbow or a shoulder or whatever. So Holy Spirit, thank you for the gifts that you give us for healing. And we ask that healing would move all across this room. In the name of Jesus, we bless you with healing. Lord, let your peace come. Yeah, so the Holy Spirit's really present here. So just keep receiving the prayer that, that you need. Keep receiving what God's doing. And then we're going to sing and worship. And then they'll guide us into communion. Yo 
from the heart. Sing out to the Lord. Every week we have the opportunity to take communion together as a church. There are two tables at the front of the room and one in the back. The tables have unleavened bread and juice on them. These elements signify Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, gives, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. All honor and glories are yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Everyone here, you are welcome to go to the Lord's table anytime during our last song to receive the elements. Goodness of God. 
goodness, Lord. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. With my life laid down and surrendered. This is running out. So, so good with every breath that I am made. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Sing it again all my life, Lord. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been goodness of God. Yes, I will see of the goodness of God. God, we recognize what you're doing here. We thank you. And as we go into our weeks, we ask that you would go before us and you would go behind us as the Bible says that you would place your hand of blessing on our heads. Friends, right now, I pray a blessing for you that you would go with the love and the peace and the joy of Christ this week and as John reminded us, with the power to receive that love and to say yes to what God is doing come to the end of our service now. We're going to stay and play for a few more minutes. You're welcome to stay and join us or to continue to get prayer, receive the elements if you haven't yet done so, but you are dismissed at this time. We look forward to seeing you next week. Shadow, and I have been 
to be with you my hope has come 